I was interested in something you said upstairs when you said you write from a distance. Well, it's interesting. What I was saying upstairs to Liz, and I met Liz for the first time, actually, I didn't even meet her. I was at Penn Faulkner, which is a foundation in Washington that gives a prize for fiction. And Liz had written Amy and Isabel, and she had been nominated for that prize. And I called her, and she was in a gruff humor in the state of Washington, where you had just been done reading, I think, in Seattle. And, um, and I thought, this is an adorable person. I want to meet her. And I did get to. One of the things that I really had noticed in every book that I've written, I, I, I really pay attention, um, even though I hate bad reviews, who doesn't? I really pay attention to them and the things that get repeated. And I became conscious of the fact that my life started in the theater with the plan to be a theater director. And um, it didn't work out that way. And I think that the theater was much in, um, in my sort of sense of point of view, from the point of view of a play, because it's out there. You're writing a play, you're imagining it out there. So in this book, I really was conscious, and especially after reading all of Kittredge and other books, Roxanna Robinson is here, and her last book, Cost, is a wonderful book, about getting very close to the characters, which I've done in this. This book actually is a book about two mothers and a daughter. Um, the daughter is Maggie and in the neighborhood where she moves. So, so in this book, I really try to take a different perspective. You mean not be as much of a distance? I mean, I'm not be at, not be sort of looking at it and having the action played out in scene on on a sort of the stage of I my see. mind and what. Um, what I really love in your work is, is the way um, you can take characters with all of their flaws and break our hearts. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> I just love to break hearts. No, <laughs> no, actually, I'm, um, no but I was, I was interested in that whole distance thing because it's like, for me, it's. Um, it's, it's sort of not, I mean, I kind of shouldn't have brought it up because I can't actually describe what my relationship to distance is when you say, when you said you write from distance because it's, it, for me, especially when it's starting for me, it always has to be the right combination of feeling deeply inside their experience, but also not, but, I ha but it has to be far enough away that I can go to things like it's just like ridiculous to even <laughs> talk about it. I see it. I, I see it and it's sort of played out and and I didn't see this play. Yeah, I, 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 I get what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. So it it's I, and I also think that the way a book starts, probably for all of us in different ways, is kind of different every time. And sure. you just yeah. you know it. It's like um, it's instinctive and and uh, do you feel it's right? right? Uh, we just know it when it feels right. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I sort of, I've certainly started many books again and again and again because they didn't, or written a lot of them and gone back because they didn't. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I know that feeling of it feeling right, but, um, but I don't have it very often. So. Do you feel very? Um, it, I mean, you've written a lot about. Northern New England, and, and I certainly feel that that's a voice that is so clear to you, and especially the, the um, directness of it, and the inability to communicate uh, on a particular level, which I think is true of lots of places. Do you feel that for you, place is an important thing? Well, I think that, you know, I mean, I think it has to be. I mean, it took me a long time to figure that out. It took me like 30 years of living away from Maine to figure out that, oh yeah, place is actually really important, um, or at least to me. And and so, 
um, because because vo voice to me as a writer, voice is the most important thing. Like who's mm -hmm. telling the story? What's the sound that's happening to the reader's ear? How is it falling on the reader's ear? And can you stay with it? Can you enjoy it? Can you enter it? Can you abide with it? Mm -hmm. Basically, so um, so finding the voice is is always the hardest um, is absolutely. always the hardest part for me. And and it took me a long time to realize that where I came from has its own particular kind of voice. I mean, every place has its own particular kind of voice. But um, because, you know, what, what we're brought up with is so natural, unfortunately, um, it feels, it feels, it doesn't feel any singular for a long, long time. And so um, it, there was a lot of time going into that. But, well, I but, sort of am very jealous of that because if you grow up in Washington, you see <laughs> one of the things you do very quickly is lose any accent that you have in the Midwest, um, and that certainly went quickly. That's interesting. Um, I can see that. That's a really interesting point. And and it's kind of you know it's a place of institutional architecture, and um, that sort of seeps into a lot of parts of Washington. But it is a real place. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <So> Washingtonians here. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's interesting, you know, that sort of leveling up mm -hmm. of, of what is instinctive. Um, yeah, yeah, it's always, at least for me, it's here. Anyway, um, I, I'm happy to have anybody ask any questions because I know that they probably have something more interesting ask and I have to say. Yeah, um, could you, I'd love to hear from each of you what the origins of the books were, what mm. the starting point was. Oh, well, she's busy. All right, I'll go first. <laughs> um, um, well, that's, that's actually a good question because I've, I've recently been going through old drafts and old notebooks and old just, you know, just all that kind of stuff and and one thing I realized was that this book that, I, that I've completed now, um, that you just heard a piece of, is, was originally sort of attached to Abide With Me, um, the, the story that I wrote about the minister. And, and um, they, they couldn't be more different, um, I think. Is that correct grammar, more different? You're the lawyer. I, well, no, I'm just like, oh, oh, copy edits right now. I feel like everything I say is wrong. But, but they're very, very different. So it's surpri it was surprising to me to find that they had some original you know, germ that, that obviously separated into two very, very, very different stories, meaning very, very different voices. So I'm always surprised at how long something's been hanging around my mind before it actually arrives. Because um, I, I find hints of this with other, other things, too. So I, I, I can't tell you what, how, it, how it arrived. Actually, that's the truth of it. This book started in, in an effort to, um, to write a funny book about a bunch of women who love the same man who was unattainable. And I was lost interest in that about page 10. <laughs> and not create much interest. But it, I had been going through, I, I was from a very storytelling family. And my brother and I had been going through our parents' things, which we had, our parents died a long time ago. And um, we had them, and we'd been going through our parents' things, and of course, seriously disagreeing with each other on everything that we found. But what we did find was that the stories that we had been told were not true. <laughs> and, but my mother wrote them down, which we assume is the truth. There is no way to legitimately find out whether they were true or not, but they were fairly significant stories. And so this book is, is a book that takes place in 1973 um, with Watergate and the Paris Peace Accords and a, an atmosphere of public lies. And it is about private lives, lies. The characters are all um, harboring something that they don't want anyone to know about. And, uh, and I just was, my mother was the most, my father was an exaggerator. 
Um, but my mother used to be quite furious at me if I exaggerated anything. And so I was astonished to see these stories. So if someone um, was sort of grand in our lives, and that's how we grew up with a sense of their grandness, we found out that actually that person was not only grand, but actually in jail. <laughs> <laughs> so it was so strange. Like, what do you do with that? Everybody's dead. And, um, and it was a whole lot of small families. So it grew up with lies. And actually, my own children are now grown up. And they have children. And, um, and I just became very conscious of the importance of the stories that you pass down. Because they take on a kind of mythic importance in the mind of a child. And they go someplace. Um, that you have no control of. So if you totally make them up, uh, anyway, that was the beginning of this book. <clears throat> so. My mother always told me I exaggerated everything. It was a constant thing that she told me. And, um, I, I have no sense of ever having exaggerated. That's the way it, it, that's <laughs> the way it was happening. <laughs> that's just the way it was happening. But it did irritate her. <laughs> yeah. um, I was curious, from your um, beginning uh, a work, and you had an idea that you, you want to develop, do you know where you're going from the beginning, and do you follow that, or does it just take off in the writing, and you don't know what's going to happen? Did you, for example, with the bike? I, I never know where it's going. I never know where it's going. I might have a vague thought of where I think it might go, um, and I'm usually wrong. Even that, we, even with a vague thought, um, it's, it's usually wrong. So I, I don't know where I'm going. I, I will, you know, continue to have other vague thoughts to give me some kind of direction. But no, I, I, I very much write from the sentence, um, if that makes any sense. It, it's like whatever keeps coming out of the, you know, the, the, the froth of that sentence, it's either, it either begins to be just worthless and foolish, which happens most of the time, so I just throw it away, or, or something will come out. And I think, oh, that's really what I want to be saying. That's what I used to tell my, my students. Look at what you really want to write about. It's there. You just make a lot of noise around it. So, <laughs> I, I'm just curious if you're saying, look at what you really want to write about, so you have an idea mm -hmm. of where you're going. It's just that no, you don't. So how do you? How can you? The sentences uh, you, will be better. But you. It sounds like you have an idea when you're saying you tell your students to look at what they want to say, where they want. Well, a student will bring in a text, you know, a few pages or, or whatever, and it's already done. yeah, and and they'll think they know where they're going. But generally, in my experience, your sentences are the best when you're writing about what you really want to be writing about, and you may not know that. In fact, you may be frightened to write about that, so you're trying to write about something. And you else. may not even know what it's about. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but I think you have to learn to recognize. Oh, the sentences are better, so. Unless one might not. That's my that's my sense. I feel the same way. Um, it, I I write about a paragraph or two of a book, and there it sits for a long time. And I'm just I've just started a new book, and I wrote the beginning paragraph. Um, and I liked it. I mean, I, it, I usually it, I throw it out if I don't like it, and I just. But I, I don't do a book for a while after I've written it, just a page of its beginning, to see if I still am interested, to see if anything's happening you know, while I do the dishes. <laughs> so um, it, it, actually, it, it, it is more mysterious to me now than it was when I was a young writer. Sort of love to know where I was going. <laughs> <laughs> really, you can take exactly. a lot of left turns. <laughs> it's like, please, please. <laughs> but the, the, the great joy, really, I think of writing is the mystery. It is the 
Maybe you did know where you were going, but it just hadn't surfaced yet in your mind of language. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just to follow up on that, so not knowing your endpoint when you begin, that doesn't interfere with um, the logic of the novel, the good construction of a novel? Well, you know, that's an interesting point because I've written um, four books now, and um, with each one, I've wondered, how will this end? And with each one, I've thought, well, just, you know, have faith and it will show up if, you're, if you just keep writing with some sense of truthfulness about, you know, making, making this whole huge mess somehow cohere. Um, and in fact, each time that happened, and I would usually write the end probably about three quarters <coughs> of the way through the book, some, it would just kind of appear to me, you know, and I would put it aside and think, oh, that's the end. And this last one, it held out for a while, i got to tell you. It was, and it was sort of like, oh, come on. You know, I, I, I've been so faithful to this faith <laughs> of like, why won't it show up? And, and it really didn't seem like it would, and then, and then it did. <laughs> I think we have time for two more questions. But did you want to do? No, I, I sort of did. Um, a question not so much about writing, but about where we're going as readers, if I could. Um, does it worry you as it does me that so few Americans are reading, and the ones that do read, so few of them are reading so called literary fiction? And that most of the bestseller lists are secret agents and serial murderers. And it, it just really worries me. I don't know what to make of it. I think it's always been true. I don't think it's anything new. Um, it, I, mean, it, I think that there have always been very few readers of literary fiction. And I actually am slightly um, optimistic about the fact that people will download on their, and I don't have a Kindle, and I will never have a Kindle because I love a book, but people who um, will download on their Kindle things they see somewhere or something that strikes them, and maybe they'll even read it. And maybe they'll, they'll read literary fiction. The thing that I find more worrying is, this year I teach in the university, we were asked to justify the English department. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> That, that to me is a real sign. Very hard to justify the <laughs> I, I would just say briefly that um, all those things worry me a lot, actually. It makes me sad. Makes me sad. Um, but I, and, and this sounds so simplistic, I, I just, I cannot think about it a lot. It's like, it's like I, I can either be a storyteller and put, and put all my energy or most of my you know, energy into just writing the best story I can, or if I look up and see things about the business or about the world, you know, whatever. So, so I'm I'm the first to admit I keep my head way in the sand, and it just stays there because I'm I'm so easily excitable that I have to. Are Are you also optimistic as she is about the whole ego platform and the changing of the ego? Um, I, I I I think it probably might not make as much difference as people think. I guess I would put it that way. I think people are probably, like you, know, you know, I think that people have always wanted stories. Some people have always wanted stories. They'll continue to want stories. They'll find the stories. And, and that's kind of as far as I can go, because then I get too nervous. <laughs> <laughs> when you say uh, look for the better sentences to find your story, what can you Try to uh, qualify what you mean by better. Mm, yeah, yeah uh, I, I knew the minute I said that. <laughs> um, it, it's just one of it's one of those things. You know, I think half your training as a writer goes into uh, recognizing that, recognizing the sentence, recognizing the sensation, and because it, it, it doesn't just automatically appear, at least for me. I mean, that's been a lot of my training is to recognize this is actually a better sentence than this, and. And so, um, and, and just, just kind of know, not knowing it right away necessarily, but just, just knowing it. I'm sorry to be that, you know, 
I was afraid that one. It feels natural. Like there's some yeah, sort of just way something. Well, you know what it is? is? You're just saying it. It's like, like, didn't Nancy Reagan, to keep people off drugs, didn't she say, just say no? <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> it's like this echoes in my head when I'm like writing badly. I'll think to myself, just say it. And then I always have Nancy Reagan in my head. Like, just say no. <laughs> no, no. But just say it. Just say it. What is it I want to say? Just say it. Or I used to say to my students, what are you trying to say? Just tell me. And then, you know, it's, so it's kind of just simplified. Um, I'm going to remind everyone that, um, that there are books in the back of the room and that you should really buy a few of them. Not just <laughs> one, but several. And that there's also wine in the back of the room. And you'll have an opportunity to talk to the writers um, personally as they're signing books. Um, so I wanted to say all that. And I wanted to thank these two extraordinary writers for joining us this evening. Thank you.